Thank you. Ms. Jim? Jim. Uh, I, I wasn't clear whether, I mean, when you were talking at the very end here, whether we're still back with the model of uh, the goal of the cap uh, uh, and that this is and how discussion is, is like that. So, I mean, the, the, the analog would be the gods of the room. Um, and now the God question is, the room. Yes. And, <laughs> and now the question is, uh, should we go for a national law explanation or, for, or should we go for your uh, the pull of God, God's goodness and yeah. salvation? Well, it seems to me if God's in the room, uh, then why choose? Uh, I mean, if you got them both. I mean, they, they both, there's no reason to choose. Yeah. Uh, and, but if if God's if you're trying to think about what what might work without God, uh, then that the natures themselves have the normativity built into them yeah. might be a better account. Yeah. So um, so if you're um, if you're a non-theist. Um, and you're not a total skeptic about morality, you better choose the natural law option. Because a the theological voluntarist view requires, right, that it, that it be, you know, that there be a theistic act, that there be a divine act of will in order to get, you know, any sort of, any sort of normativity up, up and going, right? So, so right, so, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think that's, yes, that's exactly right. Um, if you're not a moral skeptic, um, and you're a non-theist, you better give a natural account of morals. And I accept that. Why not choose? Why not? Why, why not go both ways? Well, so I mean, so, what's the view going to be then? I mean, if so, 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 so here's here's a way. Th think of the analogy. Think of the analogy between. Um, go back to the analogy between um, the account of God and, the, and moral law, to the and the account of God and the laws of nature, right? Suppose they said, oh, suppose, suppose you cared about laws of nature, right? You say, well, look, you know, why choose between? a mere conservationist account, right, on which it's created natures that have, in a way, the sort of own intrinsic causal powers, right, that any transaction in nature um, can be sort of fully accounted for by, by, the, uh, by, the, by, the, by the creature's causal powers. Um, why choose between that and a view on which, um, in which concurrence, in which there's divine concurrence as part of the, part of the explanation? Well, I say, well, you know, the boring answer is you've got to choose between them. They're incompatible. Right, so you can't you can't accept both, right? Um, here, you know, the less boring answer is you know, you say, well, why couldn't both of these stories be true? Well, the reason why both the stories can be true is what, they, what it would involve is pervasive causal overdetermination, right? What you'd have is creatures, right, that are that are always always sufficient to bring about their causes, and God sort of, you know, I put it sort of a way that makes it a little ridiculous that God sort of goes along for the ride for every you know in every causal transaction in nature. God doesn't have to do anything, right? But God just coming along and doing something. Anyway, and that seems that seems weird. Okay, um, that's a devastating objection. That seems weird. Um, uh, okay, so now, now I want to say the same thing would be true if you didn't if you if you didn't have a normative concurrence view, right? Um, I mean, if, if you if you didn't choose between the kind of normative concurrence view that I offered and the sort of net, and the sort of standard natural law view, I mean, if creaturely natures are always of themselves sufficient, right, to to morally necessitate action, right? Then, in a way, you know, so you know, why have this sort of extra element in the story in which everything sort of everything is over is morally overdetermined? But, but you have uh, in your story that God was the final cause, yeah. not, not an efficient. I mean, not, right. so you could have efficient and final working together. Yeah. Well, so so the, the view that I have of um, God is final. So, well, so, so so think about it this way, right? So the idea would be on, on this view. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm getting your objection now. But 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 let me take another turn. So so if you say even if even though it's a different kind of causation involved, right? Um, God as God is the good rather than God as as you know the powerful or the or the active or the effective or or whatever, right? I mean, you want to say, well, look, um, what we've got here is a case in which I see. Maybe actually, not think maybe it is maybe it's less objectionable on this view, right? You could say that um, every moral fact, right, has um, a kind of a, every moral factor, every moral necessitation has to be called a sufficient natural reason giving power. Okay, sufficient natural reason giving power. Um, but there's also a further reason giving power it has that's theistic, right? That is done in terms of its being. Thank you. Okay, so now I, I see the objection. Now that, that, that's very interesting. And I, I wonder whether or not that's, um, and I do wonder whether or not that's, um, that's I mean, so it wouldn't, be, it wouldn't be subject to the sort of the massive overdetermination worry. Because what you could do is you could describe. I still have a worry, though, but it's not going to be—it's not going to be that powerful. So, so, 
It's not going to be massive causal determination because you could say, look, there are two distinct normative effects here, right? One of them is the natural thing necessitating you. The other is the partly natural, partly supernatural thing necessitating you, right? And my objection just is, I don't want anything happening without God, okay? I don't want, any, I don't want there to be any real transaction among creatures, right? I don't want there to be any real transaction among creatures that can be characterized in a non-theistic way, right? So, so if, if you, in a way, you separate the effects here so that it's not just overdetermination, right? And you say, well, one of them is purely is sufficiently natural and the other one is supernatural. I say, well, great, so you've given me a supernatural one, but there's all this, also this natural one still hanging around, right, that I'm not happy with there being no sort of immediate theistic involvement, right? I said, this, this invites questions about why I'm so hung up on immediacy of theistic involvement, um, which I could sort of, again, sort of wave my hands at, but that's, that's you know, the main reason. That's, a, that's, that's great, Jeff. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm glad I understand now what you were up to. Jeff Schloss and then Peter Ricks and then Marnie and I have a very small comment. That's the way it always starts. I know that move. That's move number 23. I have a small comment. Right, I know where that goes. The comment is on the example that you gave with the cat and the plant and the plant and the plant. Yes. Well, if we put a cat in a room to hermetically seal the room and had a bowl of water and I made it with humanity in the air and come back a week later. Yeah. And I made it with humanity again and it hasn't gone up. Yeah. The cat's alive and the water's gone. Yeah. It seems to me that all those entities, yeah. the empty bowl, the cat, and the air, without advising humanity, yeah. are part of the excellent animal. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, so, um, <laughs> There must be something going around on our floor where we're just a fellow with me right now at the center. Chris Tucker's also worried about the same thing. Tell me I'm being totally misleading about this explanation, explanation, explanation thing. I don't know. So, so here's what I thought was a sort of useful distinction. And maybe, maybe the claim is this isn't a useful distinction, right? That in, in, sort of, in part of what we, in, in sort of thinking through the best explanation for some phenomenon, right? Sort of one path that we take, right? is by just asking ourselves, well, you know, what would be sufficient to do the job, right? What would be enough to get the job done? For, if we're talking about, you know, this specific explanatum, right, um, there being no water in the bowl, right? And that's what we're talking about here. I mean, now, if you want to, talk, if you want to say, well, we could just have a different explanatum, right, um, that, you know, and sort of change the way the explanation, say, yeah, fine, we, we could do that. But if we're talking about this particular explanatum, there seems to be sort of two things going on. On one side, we proceed by asking sort of, well, what's sufficient to do the job, right? And that's what I call the explanatum center stuff. And there's also on the other side, um, there's sort of two things, and what's very bad about distinguishing, we just sort of ask, well, what's around that actually could do it, right? So, you know, what exists in reality that could do, sort of abstractly considered, that we think is sufficient to do the job? And what's more, even further, right, is there anything that has to do that job, right? So in this, and that's, what I was, that's what I was pushing on with the cat, right? So, so it's not just that the cat is around, Right? That there's something, that maybe the cat is in the neighborhood, right? And is able to sort of move in and out and so forth. Because um, that would then we say, well, maybe the cat was here, maybe not. But the thing is that the cat's got to explain, right? Losses of water, you know, and changing into cat pee or whatever. That, that's just the kind of thing that it is. So there's some things that are not just um, actual, not just around to do the explaining, but they're around and they've got to explain things like this, okay? And so, so my view, the argument that I'm giving is, you know, when we're thinking about moral law, we've got, yes, as theists, there's a being that's around that's got to explain stuff like this, right? And what we need to figure out is, well, what's the best way to, to, uh, to capture that in our explanations? Here's why I asked this question. And actually, I, I concur with this intuition that God has to be part of the explanation, but... I wonder if you need the explanation-driven approach. Yeah. In fact, to this paragraph on, on uh, page 7, um, explaining the moral law by feeling the facts about human nature and the perspective of non factual realization. Well, what the quality of the explanation of, of human nature simply is the requirement of divine commerce. I'm sorry, say that again. I'm not hearing you right. If the quality of human nature of the explanation it yeah. simply is a requirement of divine commerce for for non defective uh, actualization. Yeah. Doesn't that get that doesn't that get God uh, in? Yeah. Well so 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 I'm not so so look so it may very well be that there again there, there might be specific features of 
right? Maybe, maybe I'm misunderstanding, but there may, I, I'm not denying that there might be various features of human nature, right, or various features of divine law that sort of bears on human nature that might think, well, we've got to give an immediate, kind of an obvious point, right, sort of an obvious place for, for, for an appeal to the divine in it, right? So God's got to be part of the story. It could even be that, um, that it, you know, it could even be that there, there are sort of parts of what the human um, good consists in that sort of are divine related, right? So to know God or something like that, right? And where we can say, well, once we get an adequate account of human nature, um, then, then, then it's going to turn out, right? It's going to turn out that um, sort of part of what our, that, that, that it requires, you know, God in the story as well. And I, th- and I, think, it's sort of, I think that's, I think that's fine. I, I, again, that's, a, that's one of those great projects that I sort of give the thumbs up to and you know, go out and you know, do it, right? Um, you know, you know, appealing, appealing to these sorts of features. But it's an, I, I think that, you know, all I'm saying is that I think there's a way of going that's in a way sort of more new, somewhat more neutral about the character of the human, about the, of the human good, human nature. Um, but yet, from a theistic perspective, we can see why it would be preferable. Thanks. So this is really a request for clarification, but... <laughs> that's number 24. I know that one, too. Yeah. I'm going to address that as a question. So um, what I'm interested in knowing is whether God might have created the world which is materially like us, that is to us, yeah. and it has different moral laws. Yeah. And to, to motivate why I'd like to know that, it seems to me that God is in the habit of creating everything from nothing, and we don't do that. So he sometimes <laughs> a bit like it. Um, I'm sorry, I was last thing I was giggling about. Uh, he, he creates things in Canelo, we don't, but we do something quite like it um, when we create works of fiction. Yeah. Uh, and in fiction, we have certain freedom to manipulate things, make like changes. We can play around with laws of physics and so yeah. on. What we don't seem to be able to do is change laws of morality. Yeah, it seems weird. I would say, say, Bob Beaver Rocks lives on Alice and Tori and the pink swimming pool. And, um, and his habit is uh, to spend his time putting babies on spikes, and he's right to do so. Yeah. Um, we can't do that. Yeah. And one, one thing we might conclude from that. Uh, is that God couldn't create people like us without it being the case that certain moral laws obtain. Yeah. And if that's so, then I don't see how God is essentially the kind of explanation for morality simply because he creates the world such that the moral norms and some of them couldn't be other than they are. And so why would that be explanatory enough? So uh, but I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, not getting, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not seeing the move that you're making. So, so suppose that it's true that there's a certain um, constraint right, to, to God's creating maybe, maybe, any, well, just to, maybe any rational beings, right? maybe any sort of limited bodily, we'll say any limited bodily rational, that's limited including bodily, any bodily rational being right, is going gonna, is gonna to be subject to, um, at least at some level of abstraction, non-trivial level, you know, this set of moral norms. Right? I say maybe that's true. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm officially sort of agnostic about norms of justice and about differences in kinds. And the, um, but assuming that what, what you said is right so far. Okay? Um, all right. All um, right. So what's the so what's my worry supposed to be now? Can you say it again? Well, so it seems if you were to hold the view that God couldn't have created beings which are material like us without these norms obtaining, mm-hmm. then I'm not sure why He isn't already enough of the explanation as the creator of those material beings. Oh, I see. Well, um, well, look, because because so the norms themselves. Um, you might call the, I said, like I said, the norms themselves. Their validity has nothing to do with God. All it has, all, the, all that God does is explain why there's some beings on whom it operates, right? So, so the one thing. So, so that, that and that was the move that I was making about you know, the lawgivers and, and my you know, lawgivers saying that uh, my children are going to be you know, looked after for the rest of their days, right? Um, the other thing I want to say is that you know, even if it's true, right? Even if it's true that God necessarily couldn't, you know, that any bodily, any sort of created bodily rational being, right? Um, that God makes would be subject to these these moral norms. Again, I want to say the the mere fact of necessity doesn't entail um, divine involvement or non-divine involvement in the holding of those norms, right? Because it, it could very you know I might say just bec- I might say that that God could be involved just in the following sense that because every bodily rational being right is you know exhibits the divine likeness in specific ways, right? They exhibit life. They exhibit, um, you know, knowledge as, as a human good, right? Because um, they're, they're rational beings. Um, if they're agents, they have to exhibit the good of, you know, the practical rationality has to be among the goods for them. If, if all these beings, if it's, if it's true that all such bodily beings are going to be 
social in some way, or we're seeing the you know the, the certain social goods will be among uh, will be among the uh, you know the, the available fulfillments for them, right? So it could very well be that just those limited const- just those basic constraints entails that it got, any being that God creates like that, right, will have certain things count as good for them, uh, and might have a moral law that's sil- that's similar to ours in various ways. But it could be again, sort of it could be true. Um, you know, the, the explanation for it could be this sort of moral concurrentist story. I think.